so this is the classification of glaucoma we can either we can classify according to the possible cause as congenital primary and secondary otherwise based upon the iridocorneal angle this iridocorneal angle is useful in classifying the type of glaucoma as i mentioned that the open angle glaucoma is very less common in case of dogs but the primary angle closure of glaucoma is common so based upon the pathogenesis of this glaucoma we can say it as early non congestive acute or congestive and or chronic so these are the some breeds which are predisposed for the glaucoma so coming to the primary glaucoma as a standard definition we can say that there are some group of disorders which are typically bilateral one more thing we have to know about this glaucoma is even though it is a bilateral disease usually the uh, uh, the presentation will be unilateral first one eye will be affected then afterwards after some time the other eye will show the signs so we will be having some chance to to spare one eye so it is having strong breed predisposition and associated with increasing age i already mentioned and it is a believed to have a genetic basis so genetics is a very uh, many very very predisposing factor so it will result in the change in the optic nerve and have no ready readily identifiable secondary ocular or systemic cause so coming to the primary open angle glaucoma it is a mainly progressive disorders and uh, it will take months to years to uh, develop the disease so it is because of mainly mutation in the adam ts 10 gene so beagles and norwegian elk hounds these two dogs are mostly predisposed for this so what happens in this primary open angle glaucoma is so there will be because of this mutation in the adam ts 10 gene there is decrease in half life of matrix metalloproteinase enzyme this matrix metalloproteinase enzyme is responsible for the destruction of the extracellular matrix material within the trabecular meshwork so as i am saying extracellular matrix this extracellular matrix is responsible for the blocking of trabecular meshwork so because of this matrix metalloproteinase enzyme that blocks will be digested so there will be normal outflow in routine manner but in case of this mutation in adam ts gene this matrix metalloproteinase enzyme will work only 40% of its efficacy so this defective enzyme it will increase the extracellular matrix material so it will block the trabecular meshwork mesh and subsequently it will increase the iop so beagles are useful as useful for human model for this primary open angle glaucoma because in humans primary open angle glaucoma is common so coming to the clinical signs you can see here the dilatation of the pupil mydriasis you can see the lens luxation also so if you see the iridocorneal angle we, you can see these white color things which means the iridocorneal angle is open and this is the fundus fundus examination we can see the optic nerve is depressed on the surface of the fundus we can say it as cupping of the optic disc so coming to the primary angle closure glaucoma it is associated with the pectinate ligament dysplasia i already mentioned pectinate what is pectinate ligament this pectinate ligaments are arising from the iris they are the extensions of the iris into the iridocorneal angle so there is a word in related to this pectinate ligament dysplasia so the dogs who develops primary angle closure glaucoma have pectinate ligament dysplasia but small fraction of dogs with pectinate ligament dysplasia will develop primary angle closure glaucoma in their lifetime so even though if a dog have pectinate ligament dysplasia very less number of dogs will be affected with the glaucoma so it indicates pectinate ligament dysplasia alone will not contributory contributes the glaucoma occurrence so for the understanding of the this pectinate ligament dysplasia and pathogenesis of uh, primary angle closure glaucoma we need to learn about reverse pupillary block which is a important patho mechanism and uh, it is responsible for the further staging of this primary angle closure glaucoma so now coming to the 
mechanism so whenever there is a stress or excitement obviously there will be sympathetic tone in the pupil which leads to the dilatation of the mild mild to uh, mild range of dilated pupil so because of this pupil dilatation there is increased in colloidal choroid pulse pressure so whenever there is increase in choroid pulse pressure it will be expanding and contracting in pulsatile fashion that leads to the increasing in the force towards the posterior chamber from the from the vitreous so whenever there is a transfer of force from the vitreous to anterior cham posterior chamber there will be transfer of small amount of aqueous humor from the posterior to anterior chamber so there is a increase in the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber which will lead to the increase in intraocular pressure so for the compensatory mechanism the iridocranial angle will be open because of that increased intraocular pressure this is in case of normal eye but if you see in case of pectinate ligament dysplasia this pectinate ligament dysplasia nothing but there are broad sheets of pectinate ligaments instead of narrow slim sheets so they act as a sinusia posterior peripheral anterior sinusia we know that sinusia means the attachment of the iris towards the cornea so there is a peripheral anterior sinusia so there will not be any passage of the aqueous humor from the anterior chamber to the outside of the eye so this will increase the pressure in the anterior chamber and that will press the pupil we can see here so this this is totally blocked here because of the pectinate ligament dysplasia so there will be increase in the aqueous humor in, in the, this uh, anterior chamber so this will press the pupil into the lens towards the lens so it is blocking the lens blocking the this pupil and the lens this gap so there will be increase in the pressure in the posterior chamber as well as anterior chamber so it will leads to typical a sigmoid shape of the iris so this is about the reverse pupillary block now we can see the clinical signs associated with the primary angle closure glaucoma we can see the unilateral mydriasis and here we can see that total primary total iridocranial angle is closed this is the fundo fundus visualization the optic nerve is very pale and peri papillary swelling we can see so pectinate ligament dysplasia it is characterized by broad sheets of tissue so i already mentioned there is a broad tissue which can block the iridocranial angle so now coming to the clinical forms of primary angle and primary glaucoma these four types of clinical forms they are based on the pupillary block mechanism so if you see in the latent phase there is, there will be occluded angle but the most of the times it will be asymptomatic until unless you see the gonioscope through the gonioscope you cannot find it is a glaucoma because the iop is within the normal range and there will not be any damage to the optic disc this is the latent phase so if this clinical sense and if the time goes on it will be converted into intermittent form here also the angle is occluded but because of that we will see the transient increase in iop that may be resolved spontaneously and uh, we can see the damage to the posterior segment and the chief complaint from the owner is the dog is having some disturbance in the night vision and whenever there is stress we can the owner will be watching the conjunctival hyperemia and mydriasis and hazy cornea so after after time goes on it will be converted into acute congestive this acute congestive stage is a very greatest threat to the vision of the dog so most of the times the dogs are present to the clinics this acute congestive stage only so at this time most of the damage had already occurred to the retina so there are uh, very less to average chances to get resolved so in the last and final stage is post congestive stage so if you use treatment otherwise if the con acute congestive stage is resolved by some other treatment 
then post congestive stage will be there here we can see the mild epistolar congestion and the glass grossly enlarged eye that is bophthalmos so coming to the chronic primary angle closure glaucoma this is you can say this is a end stage phase here you can see the iridocarneal angle is permanent closed you can see the ciliary cleft which is collapsed and the chronic intraocular pressure will be elevated so this chronic primary angle closure glaucoma we will see either because of the prolonged acute congestive stage or repeated intermittent attacks so as the time goes on the ciliary body becomes atrophic so there will not be any production of aqueous humor and uh, we can see the iop declination and the thysis bulbi at the end stage of the glaucoma so coming to the clinical signs of glaucoma so we, we can see the epistolar injection we can say it as red eye here you can see the enlargement of the eye otherwise big eye bophthalmos and here the dilatation of the pupil and here we can see the corneal edema we can say it as blue eye and uh, peripheral loss of vision these are the typical clinical signs related to the glaucoma so to easily to, to remember we can say red eye big eye and blue eye with mydriasis so coming to the diagnosis part the most of the clinicians they may not be having these equipments because of uh, high cost of these equipments and uh, the occurrence of the eye disease is also very less common and coming to the diagnosis part there are three tonometers we can most of the times clinical clinicians are using these types so the normal iop in the eye is 10 to 25 mm in case of dogs and 9 to 31 in in case of cats so coming to the that the type we have seen the intraocular pressure so there are incorrect techniques uh, most of the people and beginners which have which, which can commit this text so if you see in the first image uh, this uh, finger is pressing the globe so indirectly it increases the intraocular pressure if you see in this way the correct mechanism is the fi the finger should be on the orbital rim and the eyelid will be opened like this now you can see the intraocular pressure this is the correct way of watching the intraocular pressure without any error the first one is indentation tonometer so the sage tonometer is comes under this category so it relies on the gravity so uh, it uh, its use is very limited to the few animals which can which can allow us to see this like this because as it is relation gravity it should be kept vertically so as the most of the uh, farm animals and domestic animals their eyes are laterally placed so we cannot use this in case of our domestic animals so now this is comes to the applanation tonometry so this can be used for both small as well as large animals uh, the commercially the tone open we are watching here no this is a tone open this is the applanation tonometry it comes under applanation tonometry so the principle is nothing but the force required to flatten a given area of sphere here the sphere is nothing but the cornea the force required to flatten the given area of sphere is proportional to the pressure within the sphere so this is the principle behind the applanation tonometry just we have to press the cornea 3 to 4 times so it will measure the pressure inside the eye so we have to take the 3 to 4 readings average so coming to the rebound tonometry so the principle is uh, here uh, there is a probe the small probe is here it will be released from the figure, from the distance fixed distance and it will assess the motion of the probe when it is returning from the cornea so whenever there is a high iop the shorter the return distance the tone of it is example for rebound tonometry so coming to the gonioscopy this is helpful in case of deciding whether the glaucoma is open angled or closed angled 
and also it also useful for the evaluation of the treatment so these are the certain these are diagrammatic representations of the different types of glaucoma closed narrow slightly narrow open and wide open so if you see through the gonioscope this is the common structures we will see first this is a pupil then iris then pectinate ligaments in between this the gaps that fluid fluid holes way from where the fluid aqueous humor will be going out of the eye so we can say here this is a pupil iris then pectinate ligament strands in between the gaps from where the aqueous humor exits eye and this is a deep pigmented zone and superficial pigmented zone and the, finally it is a cornea we can see here the white 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 tiny gaps which are which is which indicates it is a open angle there is no problem in the intradocornial angle now let us see here the small openings are there then closed totally closed so it is nothing but some problem is there in pectinate ligaments that will be mild pectinate ligament dysplasia so if you see in this image there will not be any tiny holes in the iridocornial angle so it is because of the marked pectinate ligament dysplasia so coming to the treatment aspect in treatment we can treat as either as medicinally otherwise surgically but in case of glaucoma predominant method of treating is medicinally through medicine it is having no cure only chronic management we can do so if you see the type of medications the medications for improving trabecular outflow are rare as i already mentioned that it angle is already closed and the primary angle flows of glaucoma is more common in dogs so the, the drugs should decrease the production of aqueous humor rather than increase the outflow so the more mostly we, we we are using topical drugs rather than the systemic drugs because of the side effects with the systemic drugs so most of the topical uh, topical drugs will not absorb into the systemic circulation except adrenergic type of drugs which are beta blockers and alpha 2 agonist so this is the simple classification for the drugs of drugs which are used for the glaucoma cholinergic agonist and the drugs acting on adrenal receptors these and carbonic hydration inhibitors and prostaglandin analogs and osmotic agents in these the carbonic and hydration inhibitors and beta blockers these two are clinically used mostly so coming to the cholinergic agonist the cholinergic agonist they increase the pupillary pupillary constriction so my they are also called as also helpful in the meiotics so as there is a pupillary dilatation in glaucoma these agents can help, these agents can be helpful in achieving the meiosis but we will not, we should not use these drugs in case of anterior uveitis where the UV, the uh, meiosis is a common finding so the pilocarpine is a direct acting cholinergic agonist and dimecarium bromide which is indirect acting they acts on the acetylcholine receptors and it will lead to meiosis and ciliary muscle contraction which will leads to the reduction in iop and we can see the transient disruption of blood aqueous barrier this so it it may do, it may disturb the blood and aqueous barrier so whenever the glaucoma is because of the uveitis so we should not use this type of drugs because in the uveitis there will be there is already disturbed blood aqueous barrier if you give these drugs at that situation that will increases the damage so ciliary muscle tendons they are attached to the posterior ciliary lamellae so they are having the mechanism of action which can increase the convenience blood flow so pilocarpine the characteristic features of this drug includes it is acidic ph that's why it, it it will irritate the ocular surface that is clinically exhibited by the dog with the blepharospasm and epiphora and conjunctival hyperemia 
and this pelocarpin will decrease the 30 to 40, 30 to 40 percent of intraocular pressure. So coming to the clinical use of this pelocarpin, it is useful in only early stages of primary open angle glaucoma. As I mentioned that it is increases the conventional outflow. This is useful, this is achieved only if there is primary open angle glaucoma. So contraindication includes, I already mentioned uveitis, the anterior lens luxation. If you use, the anter if you use this drug in anterior lens luxation, as the lens is coming out of the pupil, so if, if, if you use this drug, there will be constriction of the pupil. So the lens will be stayed in the anterior chamber itself, it will not come back to the normal place. So that will lead to the pupillary block. So coming to the dimicarium bromide. So these are the some characteristic features for this drug. The action will be very, action will, uh, duration of action is very high. Myot, especially meiotic effect will be there up to 77 hours. So clinical use if you see, in chronic glaucoma we, 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 are, we are using this dimicarium bromide along with the steroids as, and some other drugs. So it is mainly used for the closed angle glaucoma. Side effects includes the systemic parasympathetic parasympathomimetic signs. So contraindications. So if the glaucoma is secondary to uveitis, you should not use this drug because this will also decreases the increases the disruption of the blood aqueous barrier. So coming to the adrenergic drugs, we have finished cholinergic drugs. Now coming to the adrenergic drugs. So first thing is epinephrine and dpvephrine. DPV, so the mechanism of action if you see the epinephrine will act on the blood vessels which are going to the ciliary body so there will be constriction of the blood vessels in the ciliary body which subsequently decreases the aqueous humor production because there is no blood is going no fluid is going to the ciliary body so in action on beta receptors in the trabecular meshwork that will increase the conventional outflow because that will leads to the increase in the gap between the trabecular meshwork. So indirectly it increases the conventional outflow. So in the clinical basis, no, if this beta receptors action by the epinephrine, it is may not be useful until unless it is primary open angle glaucoma. So contraindication includes, we should not give with parasympathomimetic drugs. So parasympathomimetic drugs, they will inhibit the esterases, acetylcholine esterases. So it is related to the uh, these corneal esterases, which are important in case of dipyphrine transformation into the phenylephrine. So these parasympathomimetic drugs, they will inhibit uh, these corneal esterases and uh, they will inhibit the function of this dipyphrine. So coming to the alpha two adrenergic agonist. So if you see the mechanism of action, so if there are two, two types of alpha-2 receptors, one is presynaptic and the one other is postsynaptic. The presynaptic alpha-2 receptors are always self-inhibitory. So there will not be reproduction of any norepinephrine. So norep if there is no norepinephrine, so the tonic stimulatory effect of aqueous humor production by the norepinephrine will be blocked. So there is also one of one pathway where these alpha-2 receptors present on the post-synoptic ciliary epithelial cells. So if alpha-2 adrenergic agonist acts on this, this will lead to decrease in the CAMP, which is a secondary messenger, which is production, which is useful in the production of aqueous humor. And this to both together leads to the decrease in aqueous humor production. And there is also one other one other pathway where the matrix metalloproteinases, the expression and enzymatic activity is modulated with this alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. So I already mentioned this matrix metalloproteinases are responsible for the reducing the blocks in the trabecular meshwork. So it will leads to the extracellular matrix degradation and increases the GBS cellular outflow. Examples include epraclonidine. So these is the concentrations availability for this epraclonidine. 
and side effects include increase in reduction in heart rate such as like bradycardia and pale conjunctiva this is the not a first line of anti glaucoma drug so most of the times we are not using this alpha 2 adrenergic agonists so coming to the beta blockers uh, we can say this as a first line anti glaucoma drugs so either beta 2 receptors acts on the ciliary epithelium which will leads to the inhibition of the tonic stimulator effect of non epinephrine and it may acts as blocking agent for the sodium potassium atps enzyme which is this is a this enzyme is responsible for the aqueous humus production so it will decrease the active transport as well as ultra filtration in ciliary epithelium now there is another mechanism which is modulation of blood flow to the ciliary body and iris so all these three mechanisms it will leads to the decreasing in the aqueous humus production so timelal molarity is an example for the beta blocker so commercially we can see this timelal maleate in combination with the darzolamide which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor so as i said that this is a first line anti glaucoma drug concentration availability is like this so this is a non selective beta blocker so clinically we can use this along with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors so that both the enzymes which are responsible for the active secretion of the aqueous humor are going to be inhibited effectively so the contraindications include if the animal is having a cardiovascular system effects uh, disease otherwise or respiratory signs so we should not use this because this will lead to the bradycardia and arrhythmias and dyspnea so if you give uh, in the one eye there will be meiosis in the other eye this is achieved with the systemic absorption by the nasolacrimal duct so other beta blockers includes bedoxolol this bedoxolol is useful when we are using in combination with dimecarium bromide and topical steroid these three drugs this three drugs combination is a prophylactic treatment for the fellow eye so coming to the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors along with the beta blockers this is this carbonic anhydrase inhibitors also a first line of anti glaucoma drugs this can be indicated in all types of glaucoma because whatever the type of glaucoma we are going to decrease the production of aqueous humor so it will work in any type of glaucoma so this enzyme is already said that this uh, it is present in the non pigmented epithelium of the ciliary body so there are seven iso enzymes among them carbonic anhydrase 2 is important so if you want to get action of this drug so the drugs should be the, the drug should inhibit the ca2 iso enzyme of carbonic anhydrase so suppression of this enzyme can decrease aqueous humor production by 40% so either you can use systemic carbonic anhydrase anhydrase inhibitor otherwise topical which are best with respect to local drug achieving in local drug concentrations as well as decreasing in the plasma concentrations so these two these two these two things are required in case of uh, achieving good results so if the local drug concentration is maximum effect will be more if the plasma concentrations are less then there will not be any systemic side effects so topical drugs always always useful more than the systemic ones so darzolamide and brinzolamide both in both of them the brinzolamide produces less ocular irritation in aspect of irritation the brinzolamide is brinzolamide is good but commercially the darzolamide preparations are more in india even though it is having the ph uh, of acidic it may cause local irritation and squinting after application so coming to the side effects this carbonic anhydrase inhibitors will give systemic side effects such as gid disturbances and diuresis and increase respiratory rate to compensatory metabolic acidosis we can see the hypokalemia also but that can be prevented with the normal food intake but we should not give this drug when there is already pre existing hypokalemia and in anorectic patients now coming to the prostaglandin analogs latanoprost is a commonly used drug 
so if you see the mechanism of action there is upregulation in the endogenous metal matrix metalloproteinases so if it is up this mechanism is upregulated then there is reduced density of collagen fibers so that aqueous humor will be flowing out from the eye very easily and they also increase the endogenous prostaglandins and they also increase the serial permeability which is achieved with the fp receptors so all these three will leads to the increasing in the aqueous humor outflow with the evo scleral pathway this is alternate pathway so this is useful in case of primary angle closure glaucoma where the and the conventional pathway is totally lost so clinical uses so it can be used in all forms of glaucoma but is mostly used mostly uh, it is helpful in case of primary angle closure glaucoma we can use it as a prophylactic therapy also so application is recommended at night to decrease the detrimental effects of meiosis because these prostaglandins are having very profound meiosis as a side effect so whenever there is a uveitis associated glaucoma you should not use this prostaglandin just like we discussed in case of cholinergic agonist so contraindications includes if the glaucoma is secondary to anteriorly luxated lens other or Okay, secondary to uveitis we should not use this prostaglandins so coming to the osmotic agents so the main important thing you should you should remember in using osmotic agents is there should be an intact blood ocular barrier so osmotic agents the name itself indicates the passage of ions within the two areas with which is which are separated by the a membrane otherwise we can say the barrier so the blood ocular barrier should be intact in order to the normal functioning of this osmotic agents so they typically used as emergency treatment in case of acute congestive glaucoma and it will increase the osmolarity of plasma which will leads to the dragging of the fluid from the eyes so the two mechanisms of this osmotic agents include inhibition of ultrafiltration process and the dragging of fluid from vitreous so coming to the mannitol the mannitol is a six carbon sugar uh, it is not able to metabolize by the body and it should be it should be excreted by the kidneys so whenever there is a damage to the kidneys we should not use mannitol the available concentrations in commercially they are they are 15 and 20% of mannitol so as it is having poor oral absorption we should give intravenously so the dose is 1 to 2 g per kg slowly over 20 to 30 minutes where the 1 by 5 that dose is given in first 2 to 5 minutes for to get maximum effect so we can use glycerin glycerol also for this purpose but they will be metabolized to the glucose so we should not use this in case of diabetes mellitus so this is the mechanism patho patho pathology in case of glaucoma at the end it is leads to the death of the retinal ganglionic cells and it leads to the blindness so as a general sense we can see the we can give the anti glaucoma drugs and an antioxidants and nerve and tonics for the glaucoma patients why nerve and tonics because there is death of the progressive death of the retinal ganglionic cells that's why we should give nerve and tonics as a prophylactic therapy for the glaucoma patients